Our guests are uh, Mr. Michael Roberts and, um, and, and Mark Blight, uh, two economists. Um, and that's uh, very important for us because we started this project in 2012. And uh, even from the very beginning, we were interested in, uh, in uh, the, um, political alternatives uh, and uh, especially the economic crisis. Until now, we didn't uh, have as a guest uh, economists, real economists, just uh, philosophers, uh, art historians, and the public intellectuals. So, but it's not my role to talk about the project. We have uh, uh, Alex Chisolekan, who is basically the coordinator of, the, of, the, of this conference series. Uh, he will introduce also our uh, good friend and, uh, and also a um, uh, very known uh, uh, author, Mitterrest Cornel Dan, who will moderate together with uh, our system from this series. So, Okay, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, friends and comrades, good evening and welcome to this fifth edition of our uh, series of conferences, uh, uh, Culture and Politics of Crisis. As Otil already said, this is uh, the fifth edition, but a rather peculiar one, since it is the first in which we have uh, political economists as, uh, as guests, uh, and actually two of the top uh, uh, political economists of our time. Uh, which I will try, whom I will try to shortly introduce. <laughs> uh, Unfortunately, one of them couldn't be here today, so you got me instead. <laughs> well, I'm actually going to write that down. <laughs> okay, so uh, at my uh, uh, left, uh, we have uh, uh, Michael Roberts, who is an economist based in London, uh, author of uh, the, long, uh, uh, the Long Depression in 2016 and The Great Recession in 2009 and uh, uh, who also blogs at uh, our, uh, our source of daily Marxist economic uh, analysis, uh, the nextrecession.com. Uh, uh, further to the left, uh, in terms of uh, position <laughs> at the table. <laughs> it depends on the day. Exactly. We should, we should see. Yeah. Uh, we have uh, Mark Blight from, uh, from Brown, Uni Brown University, US, uh, also uh, author of uh, various books such as The uh, Great Transformations, 2002, and uh, Austerity, The History of a Dangerous Idea, 2012, which has also been translated in Romania in Romanian uh, two years ago, and uh, whoever wants to uh, acquire it can get it right here. Or you can't leave the room. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, uh, besides our two distinguished uh, guests, uh, also as a moderator with me, we have another distinguished guest and a close friend of us, of ours, Cornel Ban from, uh, from Boston University, author of, uh, 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 in Romanian, uh, Dependenza și Desvoltare, uh, published at Tact, and uh, in English, a uh, brand new uh, book, uh, Ruling Ideas, How Neoliberalism Goes uh, Local. Uh, published at Oxford in 2016. Okay, uh, I won't uh, talk uh, 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 too much uh, right now. I will just uh, explain how this will go. We'll have uh, uh, an opening presentation from each of our, of our guests. We we'll start with, uh, with uh, uh, Michael Roberts and then uh, Mark Blythe. Not, no, not, not longer than 15, 20 minutes, I hope. And then we'll have uh, so uh, even, uh, even less, maybe. I'm taking his minutes. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> And then we have a dialogue between them uh, that uh, Cornell and I will try to moderate, and then we'll open the, the discussion uh, to, the order, to the audience, and uh, the idea is to finish everything by 8, uh, 8.30, the latest. Okay, so uh, your questions also uh, in, uh, will have to be very, 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 very short. Okay, and now I think we can uh, proceed. Uh, yeah, Michael Roberts, you, you want to, uh, yeah? First, let me, uh, let me apologize for speaking the language of Anglo-American imperialism, but <laughs> it now works very well everywhere, and uh, other languages are no longer important, uh, and so it makes it easy for me, at least, not to learn anything else. Um, now, Mark and I discussed how much time we're going to take. Um, he thought maybe we should just go for a quick general discussion after an opening 
uh, in presentation by both of us. Um, so I've agreed to that, and I will now only speak for an hour and a half <laughs> uh, with about 50 slides, uh, which will enable you to have plenty of time to ask any questions. But I will, um, if I can get the right one. Where are we? Yeah. Sorry, me, it's me up. particularly in Europe, where we've seen a severe economic and financial crisis which has exposed all the flaws and divisions within Europe as a political and economic entity. And, and yet, we, we go back to the end of the war, Second World War, we know that after a war between the major European powers, which turned into a, war, a world war across the globe, we have an attempt by many of the leaders, uh, the elite, in, the, in Europe to try and find a way to avoid that forever in the future. The idea of a united Europe, a Europe of peace after the war. Two great ideas came through, particularly from the social democratic leadership uh, that it developed after the war, uh, namely that there should now be peace in Europe and there should be an attempt to unite and integrate Europe into one political and economic entity. And the reason for that was also the attempt by European capital, particularly French and German capital, to begin to develop an independent force economically against rival powers, particularly the United States and uh, Asia later on. The idea of European capital being not just subservient to American capital was also part of the process of trying to unite. The Americans helped to re-establish European economic reconstruction through the Marshall Plan, through grants and loans, which redeveloped industry and re-established capitalism, the capitalist basis of Europe, rather than allow it to be taken over by communist and socialist movements which developed after the Second World War. And their aim was to drive Europe into one united entity under the leadership of France and capital, uh, France, French and German capital, bring convergence economically between the weakest countries, the weakest capitalist countries, and the, the strongest capitalist countries. And if you see the period here, the graph shows from 86 to 99 real GDP per capita, we see that in some ways that was having big success. Portugal grew dramatically, Spain grew even more, more than the, some of the advanced countries of the leading countries, France and Germany. Not all. Italy, a big capitalist economy, did not do so well. Relatively, convert, but there was some measure of convergence. In particular, in, after the collapse of the semi-fascist regimes um, in Spain, in Portugal, in Greece, and the establishment of democratic rights for people to decide their future at least at the ballot box and not be subjected to military oppression, that also meant a leap forward for many of those economies. So we did. European Union came went from a common market, a customs union, into treaties to integrate Europe on a trade and capital basis. However, once we get to the period uh, after that, where the attempt to go further in integration towards a European currency, a Euro currency, at least on the countries that apparently had sufficiently converged, then the result has been not convergence. We have seen divergence. We have seen this slope of this graph is basically to say that those on the left-hand side of the graph, blue and red lines, did better than the average in the European currency area, and those that did worse are on the right-hand side of this 
scale. And who are those on the worst? Okay, Italy, Spain, Greece, Portugal. In the middle is Germany and France. And the countries that did best were Ireland, the Netherlands, Austria, Finland. So we had divergence. We didn't have everything coming towards a nice straight line, or horizontal line in this case. We had divergence between top and bottom. So the basic aim under a capitalist Europe to bring about harmonious convergence between the weakest countries, bringing them forward economically towards the strongest countries, has failed within the Europe. It's been a, a bad and disastrous error. This is a quote from the IMF. Basically, it's saying that um, Euro area countries that had low capita incomes in 1999 when the Euro started did not have the highest per capita growth rate. And yet, that was the per should have been one of the aims of bringing about harmonious economic unity. And if we look at the winners and losers of this, we can see that in this period under the, since the Euro began, on the left hand side, who has had the biggest growth? Ireland, relatively small country, but also Germany, relative to the Euro average. While right down the other end, Italy's growth rate has been 21% less than the Euro, the Euro currency average. The divergence has been huge. Um, and more importantly, from my point of view, if I want to look at how well the European capital is doing within the nation states within the Euro currency, namely, I like to measure the profitability of capital in the private sector, the business sector. If I look at this, I can see that since 1999 to the point of the crisis in 2007, Germany's rate of profit for its private sector capital rose nearly 18%. On the other hand, Italy's fell by 10%. So a huge divergence is developing within the Euro area and the European Union amongst these economies. And then we had the global crash, growth came drubbering to a halt. And beneath that, in my view, which is a key point I make in my book and elsewhere, is that what lies behind this global crash was a, a downward tendency in the profitability of the private sector, the capitalist sector of all these major economies, including the United States. For me, we live in a capitalist economic world. The public sector, the state, does not control investment and drive investment. It's driven by the decisions of big business about whether they're going to be profitable or not, whether they can gain profitability out of further investment and expansion. And if the rate of profit, on average, is falling across the board, this is my own measure of G20 countries, we can see that we see a sharp fall during the so-called uh, neoliberal period and a struggle to return that around. And low interest rates are relatively low amongst the top 20 countries at uh, profit rates compared to where they were back in the so-called golden age of the 50s and 60s. There is tremendous pressure on average in the profitability of the capitalist sector. I'll skip some of these because we don't want too many. But here we get into the euro crash. We had the great global financial crash of 2008-9. The banks go bust across the world. Uh, German and French banks are under tremendous pressure. This also leads to serious recession, slumps. Many countries that have been expanding at huge rates suddenly are uh, turned topsy-turvy and come crashing down on growth and find that they're, they're lashing out on government spending which, and borrowing, which they're finding it difficult to finance or to repay the people who are lending them own money. Um, and how this, I think, is probably a key graph for understanding what's happened within the euro system. This is a measure of how much the peripherals, that's Greece, Italy, Spain, Portugal, owe in total capital in the private sector in liabilities through the euro system to the countries of Germany, France, Netherlands and Australia, the core, Austria, Austria the core. So the core has a huge amount of assets and those assets uh, in the, during this period privately through selling more to the south of Europe and those importing more, normally that would be paid for by credit, by bank movements, but when the banks stopped providing credit, then the, the ECB has had to provide extra funding to enable this process to continue, otherwise the currency would break apart into bits. And so you can see a sharp difference between the core of Europe and the periphery of Europe. The euro system and the euro was under such severe pressure. See that line is flat. From 1999 to 2008, the flow of money from the north to the south covers the purchases by the south of northern products. It stopped in the private sector, so the only way it could be maintained, because it's supposed to be one euro, a Greek euro with its piece of paper, is supposed to be the same and as good as German euros, even if they've got a different side to them. 
uh, it's still the same euro, you should be able to take a Greek euro into a German shop and get the same amount of money. Actually, during the middle of this crisis, some German shops were refusing to take euros that had a Greek sign on it as well. That's how severe it got because of this division that was developing. And the return on capital for the Eurozone just collapsed uh, across the board, and it still struggles to keep up. And now we see the period since the crash, what have we found? What has happened to productivity or growth of production per person in the Eurozone? It's still down. The case of Greece is down 25% since where it was in 2007. And most other countries are either flat or down. The overall position for the uh, EU15 um, is just about more or less flat. So in other words, GDP per person, on average, that's the whole economy, GDP, have not risen at all since the end of the crash in 2009. It's more or less where it was in 2007, and it only, with the exception of Germany, which continues to be the uh, mighty capitalist success. Now, this is where we have to ask, so what, I've argued that this crash has taken place for two reasons. First of all, a huge financial bubble promoted by banks which caused a crash in the financial sector in the US starting with the property market. But underlying that was a tendency for profitability and capital to decline. This was making it impossible for uh, countries to merge and come harmoniously together within the euro area. Capitalism is not uh, a system which is, produces harmony and integration. It's a system that produces expansion and divergence at the same time. It's uneven and combined. And the process of trade and capital leads to divergence, not convergence. And the pressure is always in that direction. And it's particularly strong if profitability is low. So when you get a crash, what do you do about it? Well, most uh, there are several economic policies that are presented, and we can discuss these. Should you, therefore, merely try to squeeze down uh, what you're spending, the huge debts the governments have got, uh, try to keep workers' wages down, allow unemployment to rise hugely to get costs down for capitalism so that they can reinvest and grow. That's the policy, if you like, of austerity, it's being called. Um, or do you spend loads of money from the government, run big budget deficits, and hope that the increase in spending will lead to more spending by the people who receive this money, if they get it, whether it's households or businesses, through lower taxes or through uh, help from the welfare state, and therefore get growth. I did a quick measure here. This shows the period after 2009. The, the horizontal bottom line says the change in government spending to GDP after 2009. And the vertical line says how much growth rose on average after 2009. If a lot of government spending had taken place, which in many countries it didn't, but if it had, then the line should go from the bottom left to the top right-hand corner, depending on how much you spent. So in other words, the more government, you spend, government spending you make, the best, better growth you should have. So it should be a line from the bottom left to the top right. In fact, it's virtually flat. And if I was to take Greece out of the equation, which you can see is way down there, they have reduced their government spending by about 5% over the, in GDP terms since 2009. And they, they've had a massive reduction in GDP as a result. But on the whole, if you take that out, most countries have grown, even though they've cut government spending. You take Canada, which is the opposite one. They've grown by over 4% in that period, the average rate of growth each year, while, uh, but they've actually cut their government spending. So that tells me that it's, to get out of this crisis for capitalism, it's not dependent on whether they spend money from the government to get the economy going, pump priming, as Donald Trump has suddenly invented this term uh, which we've known in the economic world for about 40 years. But uh, he, he said it, he invented it last week. Um, that uh, This pump priming doesn't necessarily decide the issue. There's something else going on in growth which decides whether capitalism grows out of a crisis, and it's not the question of government spending. So this is an issue to think about. I looked at the question of, of Iceland and Greece. This is often presented as an alternative. Greece was crushed by the Euro leaders. They were forced and are continuing to be forced to apply austerity measures to try and pay back the debt. For those of you who don't know, Greece ran up a huge amount of debt because the Greek government tried, uh, was, was taking a lot, the money was coming and flowing in from German and French banks to invest in the Greek property boom and other unspeculative areas. 
The Greek government did not tax any of this. They had a very low tax base. As a result, when the crash came, they didn't have any funds to deal with this crash and the collapse of industry and, uh, uh, and then anything else. So they couldn't, if they spent money, they just had a huge debt rise because there was no uh, revenue. That debt, which meant basically selling Greek government bonds to French and German banks, meant that the French and German banks held all the Greek government debt. And in 2012, what was the answer? The answer was the European leaders said, I tell you what, we'll save you. But they didn't mean you, the Greeks. They meant the French and German banks. We will do a deal by which the French and German banks, the money that they have spent and hold in Greek bonds, we'll pay them at a 90%, nine, 90 cents in the dollar. We'll give them back. So they only have to take a haircut of 10 cents. And all we'll take on the loan. So now the Greek government owns everything to the European leaders, to the IMF, and the ECB. And every time they get a bailout, which they got a week and a half ago, that bailout all goes back to pay the last lot of loans that they just got from the ECB. So it's a never-ending circle of debt. And they're at the same time crashing and crushing of people's sta living standards, their pensions. I've seen the figure now that the average pension in Greece has been cut by 60% since the crisis started. Somebody said, well, I was on 2,000 euros a month. I'm on 800 euros a month now as a result to pay the circle of debt that's going on. So you would say that sort of austerity would surely destroy an economy, and it certainly has. We've seen the Greek crisis has led to a huge drop in profitability of, of the Greek capitalist sector. But also, Iceland, which adopted a different policy, it adopted a policy of devaluing their currency, of renegotiating their debt, not very successfully, they still pay it, locking up one banker, well done. <laughs> Uh, uh, and then re re nationalising the banks for, for a short time and then re-privatising them again. They hope through that policy of devaluation and less austerity, you could argue, that they would break uh, back quickly. Well, on the profitability for the capitalist sector in, 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 in Iceland, certainly for the first three years after the crash, they didn't really do much better than Greece. Either way, it doesn't seem to make any difference unless uh, capitalism is in a stronger position. Uh, I, I'm, I'm, go, I'm probably going on too long, so I'm going to jump a few graphs here. I want to talk about the situation we're in right now. Uh, here we have youth unemployment around the world. Particularly, we can see Greece, Spain, Ireland have huge unemployment rates. Nothing has really been resolved in terms of employment, particularly for youth in most of Europe. But what has been the solution for lots of European countries in this crisis to leave the country. Now, I don't need to tell you, this audience that that's what's happened in many cases. And in the case of Ireland, here's the figure for uh, the great boom of Ireland. Employment comes down, uh, immigration dropped down to almost to zero. Then in the crisis, it rocketed back up. So unemployment has been held down partly in Ireland and elsewhere, and including Romania, by massive uh, immigration of the workforce. A few graphs on Romania. We can see that actually Romanian capitalism wasn't doing too bad on the way to joining the Eurozone and the Euro, so the Euro, EU in 2007. Since 2007, since it joined the EU, uh, Romanian capital has started to struggle a little. And this is who has, who has been have, being asked to pay for Romanian capital's struggle to work, out, work things out in the European Union. That is, the labour force in Romania has dropped from 13 million, is that? To 9 million since 1995. The population has dropped from 23 million to under 20 million. For me, profitability is what matters. And there is a sheer connection, as this graph attempts to show, between profitability and growth. And unless profitability recovers, as it has in Germany, then the rest of Europe won't recover either in the way that Germany has recovered. Germany's recovered by holding its workforce's wages down. Sure, they're much higher than they are in Romania or elsewhere, but actually German workers' wages have been, in real terms, have been held flat for, 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 for year after year after year as German capital expands. The Greek rate of profit remains terribly low, and therefore they cannot lift the weight of debt which is burdened upon them. Finally, I know I've gone on too long, Mark, we need to say, say a few words on this too, but um, is the euro going to survive? Is it an optimal currency union? Can it survive 
and the European Union with it, for that matter, because if, I think now we would have to say that if the euro breaks up, almost certainly the European Union will break up. The two things have now become connected, at least as far as French and German capital are concerned. And uh, an optimal currency union oops, requires free movement of labour across it, the area, and now that's somewhat under threat, at least as far as we are in Britain. Uh, we're making sure that you lot don't come over here anymore. <laughs> and, you know, you stop cleaning our houses and... Well, at least the middle class ones, anyway. Um, Basically improving our genetics as well. That's yeah. the other big payoff we hate. <laughs> but way better looking than the average Brit. That's, that, that is all true. That we won't uh, go down that road too far, though. Um, but we can see that the migration which is in the Eurozone is way less than it has been in the United States. So here are the final two graphs. This is the IMS solution to the crisis in the Eurozone now. I got this out on May 27, it's called a broadening recovery. It says the main policy challenge is to boost potential growth and income convergence, by that means the fact that there's loads of rich, there's a lot of rich, small number of rich people and the rest of us don't have anything, inequality. We need to have more growth and less inequality with structural reforms. And what are these structural reforms? We need to increase public efficiency including restructuring state-owned enterprises, in other words, privatizing them, and introducing in management and investment ne networks in the public sector. So the problem, apparently, for the IMF in this Euro crisis is nothing to do with the state of business and the public <coughs> sector. It's to do with the fact that the public sector is inefficient and uh, we need to restructure it and reprivatize it, privatize it. And also we need to improve the labor supply which implies we need more labour reforms, more higher and far, perhaps so that businesses can fire you just easily, trans opening up the labour market to deregulating the labour market. So that's the IMF solution. It, it won't be enough to change things, in my view. Um, and perhaps we ought to be looking in a different direction to bring us all together on the basis of a plan for investment and growth. As uh, Churchill said in 1946, when we had that first graph at the end of the war, Irony is something which is not provided. We must build a kind of United States of Europe, said Churchill. Um, we have this attempt that we've seen so far based on uh, the dominance of a capitalist investment, of the control of the big banks and big, uh, com uh, the big states controlling everything, so far is not succeeding. We need to think big. In my view, we need a European-wide plan for investment in technology. We need a free movement of labor with minimum wages and skills training for everybody at the same level. We need a publicly owned banking system democratically controlled. We need the harmonization of transport, communications, and manufacturing and taxation. And we need fully democratic European institutions. Direct elections to the EU Assembly that elects an EU government with the right of recall. Well, if we're going to go for integration and harmonization and convergence, then we need to build a new political unity, an economic unity as well. That's not possible on the basis of big business and capitalist process of production and accumulation requires something completely different. Yeah. Uh, then. Well, I'll tell you what we dis what, there's a couple of things I disagree on. So here's the minor one, right? The little yeah. regression line with Canada simply doesn't work. Canada's 80% tied into the US economy and was considered a haven asset in the crisis because their banking system didn't have a crisis. So they bought a lot of Canadian bonds. The bond price went up, the yield went down, and used the difference to create fiscal space. When the, Canadian, when the American economy started growing again in 2011, they took off. So what you, there's a danger in what you're doing with that graph because that's the argument of Alberto Alessina, that when you cut, it causes growth. And that's an incredibly dangerous idea because it justifies all of the malseasons which we see there. The second one, as you see in a minute, is on profits. Um, because, I don't know, I, I, I see a very different world. I've exited this. Okay, is it working now? Yes, that's okay, right. Europe in crisis, right, question mark, right? Let's see. Today, I'm the optimist. Usually, I'm the pessimist, right? So, I'll play my role, okay? Here we go. Well, maybe, here's how I think about stuff, right? 
So I think the world works broadly like this. I agree with pretty much all that was just said. I just put a different spin on it. It goes like this. So from the Cold War to 1980, you had, if you do a kind of cross time series as opposed to cross-sectional analysis of what capitalist economies look like, you don't get a kind of varieties of capitalism. Germany looks like this. America looks like this. What you get is how they evolve over time. And they cluster. And they cluster around certain institutions. And those institutions are put together in specific ways. And from 45 to 1980, for the reasons already outlined, what we had was a policy target of full employment. We had primarily national economies with strict capital controls, which while they were evaded over time and eventually collapsed in 71, consider, for example, between 1948 and 1958, there was no convertibility between major European currencies. And that was precisely the time at which the Italians had il boom and the French had le trente glorious. You had highly restricted domestic financial markets, government control over critical interest rates. In the American example, COLA contracts, cost of living adjustments, big labor, big capital, high taxes and transfers. You could run the corporatist example in Western Europe. And a lovely bit of information, no one knows who runs the central bank because they're just the check cashing agency for the treasury. It makes no difference who runs it. Then, from 1980 to 2008, we have a policy target of price stability, Uber Alice. We have globalization of markets, particularly labor markets and supply chains for product markets. Open financial markets, indeed global financial markets, flexible labor markets as the domestic complement to independent central banks for inflation control, much lower taxes and lower transfers, and crucially, everybody knows who runs a central bank because they're the most important person in the universe. So that's a very different world. Now let's have a look. Two distinct regimes, really. This is where we disagree on profits. It's all on how you calculate them. Here's US corporate profits, so 10-year moving average. Two distinct eras. They start at 11% in 1960, fall to a nadir in 1992, and are now higher than they've ever been. If I put this slide another way, and I do it as a, that's as percentage of GDP. If I do it as percentage of gross value added, it's 15%. I'll give you an example of this. Amazon's never made a profit. Seriously, Amazon has never made a profit. Last week, it spent billions of dollars buying the most upmarket grocery chain in the United States. American Airlines has been in bankruptcy protection three times. It uses the credit that it gets by buying something solvent, in the last instance, US Airways, to remortgage itself, strip out its pensions, and buy new planes. Profits are an accounting category. They are nothing more than a fiction. You can measure them seven different ways to Sunday. Two years ago, Apple paid 0.12% real effective taxes. It sits on a cash pile of $400 billion. And it didn't even use any of that to issue bonds last year, which it then used to buy back its own shares to boost its profits. But at the same time, its tax footprint was smaller than a newsagent's on the corner of that street. Let's not even start about the $14.5 trillion stashed in five tax havens around the globe, or the $27 trillion estimated to be hidden away through incorporations in Delaware, Nevada, and a handful of other places. Where I live, corporates have never been more powerful. They've never had more of the whip hand. They've never made more money. It's reflected in the inequality statistics. It's reflected in the birth of global cities. It's reflected in the politics of the moment. Here's inflation. That's the exact opposite. There was a crisis of profits in the 1970s. Kalecki got that bang on right from the start. And that crisis basically began to be addressed with the neoliberal revolution in the 1980s. And as you can see here, there's the US CPI up and up and up and up and up, basically until the Volcker shock, and then down, 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 and down all the way down. I'm going to have more to say about that because I think it's incredibly important. And then the third one is treasury yields. And this is just perfect. Right? So what, what is a treasury yield? It's a hedge against inflation. So what you're seeing there is the yields are going up because the inflationary threat's going up, and then it goes down and down and down. It's a perfect symmetry between the two periods. So what ended the first one was, as Kalecki said, inflation. When you basically increase, when you target full employment long enough in a closed economy, you will generate inflation. You will bid up the median wage, and those at the top end of the wage distribution will essentially gain rents and mobility at the expense of capital. Capital can only adjust by pushing up prices. You get a price wage spiral. Welcome to stagflation in the 1970s. Capital strike, the whole thing. It also destroyed the value of paper assets. The reset on that was these guys, neoliberal politics, and also the rise of independent central banks and globalized labor markets. 
And we ran that system out for 30 years. That was the neoliberal order. That one also ended in 2008. It's just that nobody's told you. This is debt and leverage ratios of all the banks in all the countries that go into trouble. You can't really see it from there, but let me just give you one on Iceland. Why Iceland didn't do so well? Well, let's have a think about this. Iceland's GDP is a mere 8.5 billion. One bank, Kapthung, had 623% of debt in its banks, its banking system, as its asset base. It was 6.23 times the economy in which was hosting it. That's not that unusual. We found out in 2012 that Deutsche Bank, good old safe Deutsche Bank, was running operational leverage of 66 to 1 on an average Tuesday on a capital base of less than 2%. They were basically the world's largest hedge, un unbacked, totally hedged, unhedged derivatives trader. And we didn't think of it that way. But all of the system became incredibly levered and incredibly entangled and incredibly fragile. And all it took was a bunch of shitty mortgages and some panic selling and the whole thing started to unravel. But this time we didn't Bail the, they didn't fail the system, we bailed it out. And there's the Federal Reserve balance sheet and the Euro system balance sheet. So what we did is we turned pr private debt into public debt and then shoved it on the balance sheet of ordinary people in the name of austerity programs. And then we tried to basically refloat the system through providing permanent liquidity in the form of a gigantic central bank put. So far that has cost $13 trillion in the major central banks and direct outlays for bond purchases and related programs and another $10 trillion in fiscal support. We have generated worldwide, depending on how you estimate it, between $13 and $40 trillion of negative yielding assets in the process. This is not a system that's doing well. So what happens when you bail out that system? The consequences are a massive jump in government debt. As you can see, debt was going down into the crisis, not up. And then look when it goes up, when you have to bail everything out. Not really surprising, is it? And then here's the real surprise, though, if you're a classical economist or a neoclassical economist, where the fuck is the inflation? Because you have trapped $13 trillion in the global money supply. Uh -huh. Aren't we meant to have hyperinflation now? Aren't we all wandering around with like wheelbarrows filled with money, swapping them for bread loaves, right? That's the story. That didn't happen. Let's figure out why, because that's the really crucial part of the story. Well, part of it is that Euro, wage, Euro area wage growth, if you put it in Piketty's terms, the beta has, has reversed. Capital share has gone up, labor share has gone down. They're reciprocal. One has to go up or the other one goes down. If you do it in value-added terms, you can even tell a story where both the capital share and the labor share goes down, but profits go up. It's a volume effect rather than anything else. And then the one on the right basically shows you the, uh, the black line is the one to pay attention to. Essentially, labor share of GDP right across the OECD hits its high point in 1972, right when the inflation is at its height, and then falls all the way down now to just above 58%. So that's what's happened. Labor got screwed. The world got financialized. When it financialized itself to the point that it needed to be bailed out, it did so on the back of the global taxpayer. And the global taxpayer is paying the price. And the only thing that's keeping it afloat is massive liquidity injections and bond purchases. Now, here's the real problem behind all this. And I'm going to show you the best graph in the world. You ready? This is from the uh, Japan, Japanese cabinet office's economic advisor, who was the PhD advisor of this guy, Tomonora Nari, and he gave it to me. And this is global real interest rates since 1350. It's awesome. Now, you'll see there's a, there's a yellow line in the middle where I had to fold it to fit it on one screen because the damn thing's this long, right? Only the Japanese would be nuts enough to draw this, right? But what does it show you? What it shows you is that when you have, when you have sovereign debt, Dutch perpetual bond, general republic, five-year lending rate, there's no intermediation. There's no secondary market. So if you buy the bond and you want to hold that bond, there's a chance the Dutch Republic might be invaded by Spain, in which case you've got a piece of paper and it's not worth anything. At that point in time, that's why you're asking for 10% real. But then what happens is when the Brits start to issue it and Spanish issue it and the debt market becomes bigger, the Italians and the Amsterdam guys come along and invent secondary markets where you can buy and sell it as we have now, the big bond markets are for not primary but secondary purchases. Now, when you increase the pool of capital, what happens to the price of capital? It goes down. And what you begin to see there is a very, very steep decrease all the way through modern history to the point that before the Napoleonic War, the Brits were able to finance themselves at less than 3%. It falls all the way down to the end of the 19th century at 2.21%, and by 1941 is 1.65%. 
Now, the big bit at the end is the 70s. And everything that we've ever done, every class you've ever taken, every economics textbook you've ever opened, takes the 70s as the norm and everything else as noise. But look at that graph. The 70s is the completely unrepresentative out of sample sample. It's the Kolekian regime overheating. It's that unique post-war settlement blowing itself up. And the downside of that graph is the neoliberal reset. And if you follow that out, there's the Fed funds rate since 1970. That's just going down and down and down. And you've globalized capital. You can't crowd out the globe by definition. If profits are high and capital doesn't consume or invest because it can do so because it's screwing workers and it's got globalized supply chains, so even if the margins on the individual firms in the supply chain are low, the corporate profits back remitted to the main organization are fantastically high. Apple takes home 40 cents on every iPhone. Six cents stays in, in, in China, for example, right? Then you're living in a world whereby you've got long-run mean reversion to zero. That's the world we live in. Now, let's put this in concrete terms, away from the economic. What does it mean? It means that if I walk into any supermarket in the United States, every single piece of fruit, every single vegetable has a sticker on it, a PLU. And that PLU was put there by hand. How cheap does labor need to be for that to be true? We live in a world where we constantly hear about robots and technical change. And apart from a few apps that dot on our phone and annoy us from time to time, where are all the robots? And the answer is very simple. If I'm making 12% real or 15 according to GPA, why would I bother investing in all this technology when labor's so damn cheap, disorganized, and I can screw it into the ground in the first place? So I have a world in which the cost of capital is zero. It's got a giant central bank put under it that guarantees that no matter how many negative yielding assets on the long end of the curve I generate, I'll bail it if it gets into trouble. That encourages me to take my risk-adjusted investments and shove them into Turkish equities, to put them into Romanian factories, to push out into the periphery, which if you're coming from a low basis is actually good because your wages are actually rising in real terms because I'm able to keep a lid on it in Germany, exactly as you showed. So we have a world which is very, very old, it's just that we don't recognize it because we generalize everything from this period of high inflation and deflation, which is completely unrepresentative. This is the normal state of capitalism. Get used to it. So um, let's make it as crisp as possible, uh, to get as much of the presentation as possible. And I mean what I said. Um, so um, essentially, we have seen uh, a lot more uh, agreement that it was anticipated on social media uh, before this was before the time. Yeah. It's like uh, I'm some kind of apologist for capital which is coming out of them. Uh, and, um, and we, we did see this agreement, though, uh, when it comes to the um, to the issue of um, to the issue of, um, of of capital and its position on, on profits. Um, and remarks were made about both sides of the Atlantic. <coughs> the question for um, our speakers is, uh, what is the end game? Yeah. Well, it's a good question because um, if, uh, as Mark says, we're in a normal situation for capitalism with low inflation, uh, low interest rates, uh, huge amounts of profit floating around to be either speculated in or invested abroad where, it's ch where cheap labor can be found. Uh, this would suggest to me that if it were normal, how do we go from the normal to the abnormal back in the 1970s? And are we, now everything is fine. Does this mean that in some way we are going to have uh, growth within the European Union as the weaker countries start to get the investment for using their cheap labor coming up to the bottom? Or are we going to have a, speculative, a new speculative bubble which leads to another crash? I'm not clear exactly where this leads, and I think that's the issue that we, we need to discuss. Of the two, two areas that Mark uh, raised in disagreement with me, first of all, was the question of profitability. Mark showed you graphs which shows the share of profits in the US 
total profits, corporate profits against GDP or value added against the uh, uh, sales made by the corporate sector itself. And they have been at very high levels. Those margins are at very high levels historically. So the question we'd have to ask ourselves is why is investment so low relatively to where it was before as a percentage of GDP in the US? Uh, why have we had a, if this is the situation, why has there been a crash anyway? And why would, did the economies go down? It doesn't appear that that particular measure of profit, profit tells me a lot. I prefer to look at the measure of profit against what capitalists have built up in their stock of capital and invested and to see whether, whether that profitability is rising. And that's certainly not been the case. By historic post-war standards, US uh, profitability related to capital stock is relatively low. What we've seen is a lot of profit, which is probably mostly fictitious. It's been used to invest and speculate in uh, the financial sector, uh, to boost the stock market. And as Mark says, it's been funded by cheap uh, credit coming from so-called quantitative easing from central banks to drive up a huge uh, financial bubble which burst in 2008. Uh, now, I don't think we're in an environment which we can call normal, if there is such a thing for capitalism. We're in an environment where capitalism is struggling to get growth going again. Growth across the board for most of the uh, advanced capitalist countries is well below the trend level that we saw before 2007. Uh, that was about 3 to 3.5%. Three and, and now the best country, the US, is growing at 2%. Uh, Europe, uh, as a whole, on average, Germany's doing better, but on average, one to one and a half. Japan, one, maybe one and a half. Well below trend levels. Even the big economies of the so-called emerging economies are growing below where they were before uh, the, uh, the Great Crash. So this doesn't seem to me an environment which is normal. It seems an environment which is depressed. It's uh, not in, 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 in a, capable of growing and restoring the levels of employment that we, we would expect in the great golden age of the 1960s, and certainly not in Europe, and certainly not for young people. Uh, it's not restoring real incomes. We've just found out, you know, in the UK, that the UK has just, uh, the Bank of England pointed out that real incomes for the average household in the UK have been flat or falling for the longest period of 166 years. Now, it doesn't seem to be very normal to me uh, uh, if capitalism is healthily in a normal environment going forward. Unless we've been by normal, that it's continually open to crash and financial instability. And perhaps that's what we're doing. I'll finish on this other difference. Uh, my graph on measuring the amount of government spending to GDP against GDP growth was meant to show that there is not much correlation between the two. It wasn't meant to show that austerity gets growth up. I don't think it does show that. What it shows is that growth takes place for other reasons apart from whether governments spend more money or carry out austerity. It depends on what's going on in the capitalist sector in terms of investment and profitability, which decides whether growth is going to deliver in terms of labor, increased labour productivity and so on. And at the moment, labour productivity on most of the advanced economies is below 1% a year, or even zero in the case of uh, the US and the UK. Capitalism is not a normal environment, it seems to be in an impressed and a difficult situation. Even if there's huge profits being made by a small group of uh, top multinational companies that they're stacking up abroad and hiding in tax havens. There's a whole swathe of companies who are not making a profit and can hardly service their debt. Zombie companies in most of the countries of Europe and the US. There's a big difference between the top and the bottom within the corporate sector itself. So I don't see this as an environment of normality. I see it as a, an environment of severe difficulty for capitalism. And they find the only way that they can attempt to get out of this, of course, as Mark, as Mark has said, is trying to make workers pay for it <coughs> in keeping their wages down, in not employing everybody, and reducing the cost of taxation for them, and trying to increase it for us. All right, so I'll say it is normal. We'll just pick it up there. And that's, what I mean. that's what I mean by normal. Yeah. Um, in 1945, the United States had 50% of global GDP and 60% of the world's capital. That was a historically unique phenomenon. There was n there's never been a moment like that. And since then, I mean, if you think about the Marshall Plan, it's interesting you tell the story of the Marshall Plan that way. I used to tell the story of the Marshall Plan that way. Uh, but it's weird, because you've got these Europeans who want to build up their own form of capitalism and their investment banker or their, com their competitors. 
that, that seems a bit weird. What actually happened with the Marshall Plan, and Eric Aliner's work on this is, is brilliant on this, is uh, essentially there was a prior move to convertibility. This is why there was no convertibility for that 10-year period. In '46, the Brits, who basically will sell their grandmother for five pounds, uh, basically said to the Americans, we'll have convertibility to the dollar to the pound. And then this, the, Europe, the, the, the Brits said to the Europeans, you need to basically get a payments union going. Why don't we have convertibility amongst, not amongst yourselves, but individually to us? And what happened was there was a giant sucking sound as every piece of investable capital in Europe left, went to Britain, they took their fee, and it ended up in the United States. It was huge investor capital flight. Because if you were an Italian capitalist in 1946, the chances of you being shot by the communists was actually pretty high. So you tried to get out. You wanted to liquidate your assets. So the Marshall Plan was actually US taxpayers' money given back for that capital flight. It wasn't actually about investing. It was, it was literally keeping capitalism together that way. And it's the financial linkages which I think are the most important part of the story. When you look at over the very long run, there is more money than there's available investment. Not because it's a generic crisis of investment, but because if you have a high low and equal society, people with money don't need to spend it. They spend on stupid shit. Does anybody subscribe to the Financial Times? You know what the magazine's called that you got on the weekend? How to spend it. <laughs> it's just filled with watches and cars and bullshit, right? So we have a world in which an incredibly skewed income and wealth distribution. The taxes make, the tax system makes that worse. And you literally don't have to, to do this. One of the founders of Amazon actually has a great quote on this. He says, I started off selling pillows. And I made a lot of money doing that, but I only need one to sleep on. I could buy 5,000, but that would be rather, rather pointless. So there's, there's a kind of like deep under-consumptionist and equality story there, which I think is important. And when the Americans lose this incredible preeminence, the rest of the world starts to come up. It just looks more normal in that sense. Um, second one, and something we never talk about that I've become really fascinated with as I get older, is demography. Old people suck. And, and Europe is filled with old people. I'm one of them. I'm 50. Guess what the average age of your average European is? 43.7. So what happens is you save too much if you have money. And if you don't have assets that generate money, you'll never actually form those assets now. So you'll become a debtor. So that's basically the way these things schism out. Old people live on fixed incomes. That means they hate inflation. That means they tend to vote for parties that give them strong anti-inflation policies, hence the Grey Tories and the coalition behind the CDU and everything else. So as these economies get older, they save too much. There's nowhere to put the money. So what did they do? They sent it south. And then you got to buy the stuff the Germans made on vendor financing until the whole thing went wrong. So demography itself has a huge independent effect on this as well. So American exceptionalism, democracy. And the last one is, and this is why another aspect of low investment, how do you calculate service sector productivity? I mean, if you do it by an output method, then you know, it doesn't make sense to me why bankers get paid what they're paid. It doesn't make sense in general, no. right? But there's, you know, there's deep productivity issues in this in terms of how would you calculate. It's not marginal contribution to product which determines wage. You can't easily add capital to a service sector job to increase productivity. You can't give everyone a giant set of shears for hair cutting and we all got our hair cut in a line of 500 people. That doesn't make any sense. So when you have economies like the American economy, the British economy, that are over 80% services, right? You just do, what exactly is the capex of a financial firm? It's a spreadsheet. So why would you expect to see large capital investment? That type of capital investment's going on. It's called China. It moved. It went elsewhere. And as a <coughs> consequence, 1.2 billion people who were below the incredibly meager $2 poverty line of the World Bank have in the past 30 years gotten up to $4,000, $5,000 and $6,000 per capita. So remember the back at Branko Milanovic's elephant curve? Yeah. It's good to be the elephant's arse. The only thing is we're stuck on the trunk. And we're not the whole elephant. OK, I guess it's... Uh uh, shall we open the... Yes. Yeah, they all came here for yeah. something. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah, we'll open the floor for questions from the audience. Uh, anybody, but just keep them short, please. If uh, nobody will take the opportunity yet, I will. Uh, I will. <laughs> you didn't even wait. <laughs> <laughs> I know, it's so like a... That's why we love it. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> because I see uh, uh, both of you come back to this period, which both of you define it as, as exceptional, the post-war period. But I, I don't understand very well how uh, you explain the, the cause of the transition from that period. I mean, I, I can understand uh, Michael Roberts' point that it was uh, uh, the fall in the rate of profitability that finally pushed towards the, the, the changing of the regime. And I can understand that this kind of uh, explanation has uh, certain, certain limits uh, when it comes to the possible solutions, possible political solutions, because you know the, the, the usual objection of uh, waiting for Godot. <laughs> as, as for your narrative, uh, I, can't, uh, I can't identify the cause, the deep, if there is a deep cause, a fundamental cause that led to this uh, uh, change of regime from the national economies of the post-war period to the, I mean, besides, I don't know, conjectural or ex exogenous uh, factors like... No, I, I actually agree. It's a crisis of profitability. I really, I, I'm completely in agreement here. This, the 1970s was a crisis of profitability because what you have to look at is the risk-adjusted rate of return on assets over time, which is only determined by two things. The time discount of value of money, the risk-free rate, what would I get for putting this in bonds, right? And bonds are on the floor, and you've got high inflation. So in that world, if you were making 7% and suddenly inflation goes to 8%, you're on negative one. And if you run this out and you begin to think that those inflationary cycles are going to spiral up, then there is zero point in investing. But what so did inflation do? Inflation went up because you had relatively closed economies and when you target full employment as a variable for 30 years, particularly when you have strong unions, then capital share has to go down. In, in, in Piketty's terms, beta, right, the capital so share it's a has to go. Between it's totally and wages. Absolutely. And therefore, the pressure of workers <coughs> and on full employment <coughs> drove up inflation. So drove, drove up inflation. Not, and squeezed profits. And it has nothing, the monetary story of inflation, that's part of that graph I showed you, like 13 trillion of interventions on, is wrong. The money, there's no inflation because we have globalized labor markets. And when you have globalized labor markets, if you don't like your wage, I'll take it to China or wherever else, or just the threat of that keeps it down. For German unions, they still have strong unions, but exactly as you said, right, the wages have been compressed. Why? Mm -hmm. They know that globalization starts 60 kilometers outside Berlin at the Elbe River. It will be here in a week, right? Which is pretty good for you guys, but pretty crappy for them, right? So once you're in that world, Right? It's a completely different ball game. Once you blow the ability of the national economy to generate inflation out, right, you have a system reset which is very much like the old system of capitalism, not the, the golden age. The golden age was a unique experience. And it was made possible by things we haven't mentioned, the existence of the Soviet Union. The very real idea that socialist planning could actually work. The very real idea that workers' power through, for example, the wage earners funds in Sweden could socialise capitalism on its own terms. These were critical threats to capital, not just as a, an economic formation, but as a social formation. And they rebelled. And it started in the late 70s, and they finished the job by about 1990. Is it, do you think it's an accident that Alan Greenspan looks like Yoda? I mean, I'm just pretty. <laughs> And he was right about everything. <laughs> mm, hard to see the discount rate is. <laughs> so there, yeah, I agree. Well, uh, let's not reach the agreement to soon. Now. No, no, uh, no, I see a hand uh, raised there. Uh, how do you see the goal of the expansion of the EU towards central and Eastern Europe in terms of uh, um, economic crisis or in terms of the cyclical nature of capitalism and crisis? Well, I think EU enlargement is, was an issue, I mean, if we start from the point of view that the purpose of the EU is not actually, from the point of view of capital anyway, to bring Europe together <coughs> in peaceful harmony, that was obviously war which should be avoided between European nations, which is important for capitalism just as much as it is for the rest of us. But the main reason was to establish a, a new powerful economic block and financial and investment block in the world which could take a bigger share of the total profits away from the 65, 70% hegemony that the US had. The US was, the American, European capital, French and German capital was going to carve its own share out of this uh, globalized and developing world and, and to build that share on the basis of um, capitalist investment in not just the core countries of Europe, but also to spread that out across the rest of Europe. And in particular, France was very much in favor of enlargement. 
And it's clear why, because they wish to have more nations politically in the European Union to give them some measure of control over the, the German capital. After all, they married with German capital, but it was a fractious relationship, or could be. Uh, divorce was possible. Uh, that German male capitalist was out there looking around for other possibilities to invest abroad in China and so on. The French needed to, to keep him at home, and to do that, to expand more nations into the political union, uh, bring those in, the 27, uh, then it would be possible to have more political control. But by bringing more nations in, of course, you increase the inequalities between the highest productivity nations and the lowest one and the highest income ones and the lowest one. And the idea that 27 nations are going to move towards some sort of harmonious equality in terms of income, in terms of employment, in terms of productivity and investment through the process of uh, the movement of capital and labour under the, the, the regime that exists at the moment in the European Union is a pipe dream. We will continue to have these huge divergences. Sure, there will be periods where countries like Romania will perhaps grow faster because there's investment taking place and cheap labour can be applied, uh, can be used by German and French and Italian capitals to some extent to, to expand that. But it won't change the overall inequalities and therefore the flaws which exist in the current system that could explode apart if we could have another financial and global uh, economic crash. Uh, this last one was so devastating, you can see the flaws in the political and economic union in the European Union. Now, the healing process is taking as slow as it is for me with my current ailment, which I won't go into. It's taking an awful long time, and it's, a, a, and it's a really been a long period of depression before there's been any limited recovery, which you've just seen in the last year. And then, what is the prospect? If it's, I'm going to raise this point that, in my view, capitalism seems to have regular and recurrent crises, financial and commercial and economic slumps, every eight to ten years, of varying degrees of severity. The last one was very severe. We're already into the eighth year of recovery since the last one. Uh, now, maybe I, I'm wrong and it's going to be not normal this time. It's going to go uh, 20 years before we have another slump. We're going to have ten years of boom across Europe and the rest of the world. I very much doubt that. I think the, the, the process of regular and recurring crises is endemic to capitalism, and we would like to have one in the next few years, if not earlier. In that situation where Europe is only just recovering, and the, the weakest nations are still trying to recover from the, the slump that took place, and a place like Greece has basically been crushed to death, that, well, just tell how shocking it would be, just when Romania appears to be growing faster, employment's picking up, uh, property prices are booming, it's all looking great, and then you have another slump. And Romania and other small capitalist countries will be the ones who get hit the hardest. Just a little bit about the politics of this. I've always been fascinated by Eastern expansion because if you're a Brit, you have to remember that the whole thing was classic British divide and conquer. Right? The reason that we loved Eastern Europe and wanted part of the EU was so we could screw the French and the Germans. It's perfectly obvious. Uh, the Germans, on the other hand, did the original Eastern expansion in 2004, pop quiz, to which countries? Visegrad. Visegrad, right. Why? Because they're all white and most of them speak German. It was a way to solve the population problem. This is the demography one. Germany has, next to was it Finland before their pension reform, the second highest or highest replacement rate on final pensions for private sector employees. And in a world in which your interest rates have collapsed back down to 2%, it's very hard, percent, hard to make 7% real. So one of the ways you can do this is by importing people who will pay massive amounts of consumption taxes and income taxes. That was the point. You were basically there to pay for Otto's pension and his retirement. Unfortunately, nobody was paying attention to the gross financial flows in the banking sector behind that as the whole European banking system became one giant banking system that was under collateralized and over levered. So when it went bang, we are in the world we are now. So essentially, you know, what does it mean to bring them in? They were brought, you guys were brought in for political reasons and then it became economic reasons. And then in the crisis, you were the test case for the original version of austerity in 2008, 2009. And then since then, you seem to be leading the way out of a recession. But exactly as you just said, tend to have a slump every eight to 10 years. Don't hold your breath. Okay, more questions? Sorry. Yeah. 
Uh, hi, I'm, I'm Florin Poenaru, and thank you for your talk tonight. I have two questions for each uh, speaker, very short ones, and they relate to the question of profitability again. How do you respond to this argument of uh, accumulating wealth and increasing inequality that Piketty and others make? Basically, you have this um, secular tendency of uh, accumulation of wealth, concentration of wealth, and increasing inequality. Uh, and if this transfer happens for the upper classes, for the 1% or even less than that, why would they need to invest in production if transfer is happening? I mean, what would it be the purpose of still having capitalism and having all this process of uh, production going on if this transfer, for whatever reasons we don't know or maybe we have uh, ideas about, happens? So, yeah. Mark? Um, all right, so I actually want to answer the second part of that. Um, <laughs> so, you know, I'll, give you, I'll give you one little bit of it, right? So guess how much it costs to go to my university for one year? $64,000, one year. We get 17 applicants qualified for every available place. We give crap financial aid. The global 1% is very, very rich. And it's very determined to pass on every single bit of its wealth intergenerationally to its kids. And it does that through a series of elite institutions, which then give you access to elite internships which then give you access to elite jobs such that they become a self-reflective, self-perpetuating clique. That's it. Now, to my question. Um, <laughs> so, uh, I mean, no, I'm serious about this. I mean, like, there's a thing in accounting. If accounting say, uh, sentences I never thought I would say. Accounting says fascinating. Um, <laughs> But for example, there's a thing called goodwill. Right? Yeah. You know what? Account, account, right? This is a, the biggest pile of bullshit ever, right? So, so a tech company buys a food company, which is what just happened, right? And somehow you have to make those assets congruent in the final balance sheet. So you just get this category called goodwill, and you go two billion. Way there you go. So you've just taken two billion worth of value and moved it from one side to the other. You just made this up. There's literally no there there. Now, profits are, of course, the end point for any capitalist or any capitalist firm, and without profits, there can't be investment, etc., etc. Get all that, right? But when you're looking at this is why all the measures are different. Right? You're using the Kalman method, uh, I look at gross value added, they all tell you different stories, mm. right? The different ways you look at it. And I, don't, I honestly, genuinely don't know which is the right one. I mean, just where I am and where I live and the school I go to, all the rest of it, I mean, I think the American corporate sector is it's rolling around in cash. I mean, I mentioned Apple has 400 billion in cash. That's an insane amount of cash, right? So what's their profitability? Well, their official profitability is 0.12%. What the fuck is that? Like, that's a figure? That doesn't mean anything. So that's why I'm skeptical on that stuff. On the questions? Oh, my Sorry, I was going to say on the, on the question of Piketty. Now, though, I'm sure most of you have uh, bought Piketty's book. I'm not read it. It was uh, voted the, mo the, the most popular book uh, in 2014 that hadn't been read, and therefore replaced uh, Stephen Hawking's brief history. I time. need to say that all the time. I did exactly. I said in the 1980s we had this already with Stephen Hawking. Everybody got five pages in and went special theory of relativity, right? Fuck that. <laughs> so, uh, uh, for my sins, I have actually read Piggy's book uh, from one end to the other and around again. And uh, Thomas Piggy is telling us, with a lot of data, that there's been a huge increase in the inequality, not only of income, but also wealth, and that it's increasingly concentrated in the top 1% or even the top 0.1%. Subsequent papers by him and his colleagues have shown that this is not improving. In fact, it's uh, worsening. Uh, and that it's also, he has shown that uh, the inequalities in household income and household wealth, which is what we're talking about, or personal income and personal wealth, not what's going on with corporate profits, He's saying that, that this has also been reflected in most of the other countries, and it all started in the so-called neoliberal period from the early 1980s. We've seen a dramatic expansion in inequality, and we can also see this, the uh, Credit Suisse has done uh, surveys to show that this is also the case globally. We see a very large increase in inequality uh, to the point where, according to Credit Suisse annual wealth report, the top 1% of household wealth holders own 51% of all the wealth. The top 10% own 87% of all the global wealth. 
Now, that includes you, most, many of you are in the top 10%. Did you know that? In wealth holders around the world? We that are. shows you how poor the majority of people are in the world, how they have absolutely no wealth at all, however you want to measure it. So that shows the inequality. But these inequalities are growing. Piketty showed this. Now, there is a debate about why in this inequality has grown. And that's the issue, perhaps. I, I, uh, he, he says that it's um, due to the fact that um, there's a certain level of return you get on your assets. And if the share is shifting towards capital as opposed to labor, which it clearly has, then there's a self-perpetuating process of increased inequality amongst the, the small people who have all the capital <coughs> assets. And I think that's a reasonable explanation. Uh, the issue I, uh, I would have with that, that doesn't necessarily mean that there isn't a, a, an increasing tendency for the profitability to fall in the corporate sector. What we're seeing is an increasing share of what is produced and made profitable being shifted to a very small number of people. And that shift in the capital share is driving up the inequality <coughs> in household wealth. So if I'm a rich billionaire sitting in my house, uh, in my several houses, in my several yachts, and my several other foundations. You can only sit in one of them at a time, that's the problem. That's, it is a problem, but you can keep the servants moving around so that they're ready for you. And uh, through my several foundations for equality and democracy that I've set up uh, in order to avoid paying tax, uh, uh, all, all these uh, things are, are going ahead. Now I'm saying, well, that means that there's a huge amount of profitability in the companies. Well, no, it probably means that the assets that they own financially their stocks and their shares in their companies and the properties that they own have rocketed in price. And there was a very good piece done by a graduate student at the University of Amherst, Massachusetts, who said that if we strip out the increase in property and assets and equities that the big top 0.1% have earned or, or have accumulated, if we strip that out, the property part of it, and just look at the productive part of the economy, it's a different story. Then lots of companies aren't doing so well. And the inequality doesn't look so big when you take it out of the household sector and go back to the corporate sector. Now, we can debate this at some extent. All I would say is that it, it doesn't mean that just because there's a big increase in inequality and there are lots of, well, not lots, but the small number of billionaires, they are increasing in number, but there are still a tiny number, are even more billion than they were before, and the inequality is growing. It doesn't mean that there isn't a problem within the ability of capitalism to deliver investment and production, because they only do that if there's profit to be made. And on the question of accounting, I agree. You look at the accounts of a company, you can tell nothing anyway. about what the profit really is, what the return is. All we can do or at least in my case, and all I can do as an economist is to try to look at the overall angle and the average profitability that's uh, delivered, how much profits are coming across the whole of an economy. If I take out one company's accounting tricks, I will find it very difficult. Lots of people spend hours analyzing the big companies, mm -hmm. trying to work out exactly what their position is in terms of profit, and as Mark has said, all the tricks that they do in accountancy it is fascinating. Uh, to realize that just what the real position of the company is. And that's why sometimes when a company announces uh, they have made record profits, expectation above a level, and then the, market, the share price of that company goes down. Why? Because analysts are going to say, oh, this is a load of fake. And actually your, your profits in the future don't look so great. So people are making decisions on individual companies. We can't really tell much from that. We have to look at the aggregates in mind. Thank you. Other questions? Yes, here. Hi, I guess I'm, I'm going to um, switch uh, the, the discussion to, uh, to another direction, maybe. Uh, let's take a more practical standpoint, uh, starting from this uh, uh, fiction of profits. Uh, as you all know, um, um, workers all over the, the, the world are trying to, uh, to get a bigger share of, uh, of these profits as wages. Now, if, um, if profits uh, are uh, calculated in uh, 16 different ways, and uh, none, of, none of these uh, tell the, the true story, how can one uh, uh, trade unionist formulate, um, I don't know, correct, uh, valid uh, 
points in order to uh, convince, you know, in a, in a discussion, the, the, the capitalists to provide more for the workers. Uh, and uh, I, I will add another, uh, another thing. Uh, this whole discussion about productivity is also, well, let's say it's uh, bluntly bullshit, because there are several ways to calculate this, this, uh, uh, this thing, and uh, of course, um, nobody can agree which is the correct one. So uh, I guess that's, uh, that's my question. Thank you. So the question is, uh, how, what's, the, what's the lesson for trade unionists? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so a very simple one is, um, things happen at the level of governments if they want them to. So the real question is, why is it that Europe decided it didn't have to care about labour anymore? Like, why did it just stop caring in that sense, right? And to me, that's a genuine puzzle, because if you read the treaties of the European Union, and as well as reading Beccaria, you can read these things, um, Article, Article 125 makes it quite clear that the whole purpose of the European Union is to increase the welfare of European citizens, not to bail out banks, not to do all this stuff, right? But beneath the surface is a few things that could be done. Let's look at this historically. Back in the golden age, corporates paid about 10% of total taxes. Now they pay 2.3%. Right? So that's base shifting, that's uh, hiding fictitious profits, lowering your profits so you pay less taxes, all that sort of stuff. If the European Union wanted to get serious about this, it could. It really, it's actually relatively easy to do. You basically have an intergovernmental agreement that says everybody has Ireland plus 3%. Everybody's 15% and everybody collects the taxes. And if you want to opt out, it's very simple. You can opt out, but then we'll put an import tariff on you if you try and sell in the, in the EU, which is what Trump is basically doing with the border tax adjustment. Now, we can say, well, that's against free trade and all these things, right? But the point is, there are things that can be done, right? Common base erosion, going after p companies stashing their stuff in tax havens. There's lots of ways to increase those revenues. And what can you do with those revenues? You could basically retool, uh, retool the relationship between unions and labor markets and skill formation. And we could really invest in that so that what you've got, and partly what you have in Romania, is you know, the lucky legacy that you guys had is loads of good math schools. There's a reason the transmissions for Mercedes are getting built here and shipped out elsewhere because of good technical skill bits. Well, you can build on that and have wage-led growth. Ireland grew because of wages going up in the export sector, which was primarily pharma and high-tech exports. So, you know, there are bits of Europe that actually understand this, and then there are bits of Europe that are heavily conflicted and what to do about this. And the role of politics is to put pressure on the right place so that we're all singing that story. This is not a mystery. It, a lot can be done. It just lacks political will and leadership. I think the work ethics have changed a bit from our parents to the young generation. And there are a lot of uh, young people who don't really want to work like their parents, who don't want a nine to five job. And also they really don't want to consume like their parents were taught. How do you see this um, playing out for capitalism and also for socialism? Well, if I understand the question, uh, you're, I hope you're not suggesting that all us young people, including yourself here, <laughs> are lazy, good for nothing. No, uh, they're not content with a nine to five job, they're looking yeah. for meaning, whatever that means well, for meaning a, in their jobs. Yeah. Marx used to call this alienation. <laughs> and, and he said, that, you know, when people go to work, most people don't go to work because they enjoy every second of it. They can hardly wait to get there to be told by the employers that they're uh, going to have to work in 30 degree heat because it's necessary to get something out. Uh, that uh, if they make a mistake in some particular document, they can expect to have their pay docked or be demoted. In other words, to be continually abused in various different ways uh, and to be toiling to doing something, and I call it toil, not work, this, uh, toil for it because you have to make a living. Now, work in, for human beings is something we want to be active in doing different things for which we enrich our own personal self-development and other people's. Now, I'm afraid 
that 99.9% .9 of us are not in that position. Uh, only a very few people, maybe like Cristiano Ronaldo maybe, uh, uh, are able to kick a ball and feel great and doesn't matter about the money anymore. Uh, but the vast majority of us are not in that position and therefore we're faced with having to make a living. However, there is that continual rebellion from people who would say, why do I have to go through this hell uh, in order to get a living and then perhaps have a family and then have even more hell? Uh, <laughs> and both of you going to work and not, and not having childcare and you work. I don't need to tell you the history of my life. But uh, <laughs> uh, uh, this, this, this situation is, is what the alienation means in the workplace under capitalism. And it's not possible to change that Except in one way. The only way that it would be changed if we could drastically reduce the working week or the working life that every human individual has to combine. So they have a whole load of extra time beyond the toil bit for development of themselves. Now, is that technically possible? In my view, it is technically possible. There are three billion people in the world of working age. Three billion. Uh, if you added up all the hours that they work for toil, then you get a figure of how much is having to be put in. Is it possible that we could expand production in a more technologically innovative way that allows people the flexibility of time and reduces their hours? Back in 1931, John Maynard Keynes held a meeting like this with his students because he was worried that the students were all going to be communists. Uh, so he held a meeting to tell them, look, I know it's a depression, I know it's a mess, but don't worry. By the time we get to your grandchildren, everybody would be on a 15-hour working week, and you'd hardly be doing it, and the robots and the technology would have taken over and solved the problem. I have to say, um, it hasn't happened. Uh, and average working week for most people has not changed in the last 25 years uh, in the advanced countries. And of course, I'm not talking about the sweatshops of uh, Asia and so on, where it's a different kettle of fish. Still, it's just like it was when Marx first wrote his book in Capital in 1867, the sweatshops of the UK are now the sweatshops of India, Bangladesh, China, Vietnam, Burma, and more. That, so the situation hasn't altered, and the technical possibilities of achieving a 15-hour week for everybody, so that there's flexibility in what they want to do and they can reach themselves, has not been implemented because it's a blockage of a system where everything is run for the benefit of a few billionaires, and the profits that they make out of their companies are not in the interest of planning for everybody. Bill Gates has an interesting proposal on this. He does, it's seriously. It's like if you put a robot in place of a person, the robot pays income tax. And then the robot pays social security tax. So that way you democratise the returns to robots. And if you do that, you can make it work. And if you don't, we'll, we'll smash all the robots. Um, <laughs> just a couple of comments. First one is the idea of Cristiano Ronaldo as the perfect example of unalienated labour. It's, <laughs> it's so mind-bending in so many ways. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take that with me to my grave, which hopefully will be a very long time from now, because I'll be augmented by robots. Um, but the, the serious part of the question is, I, I think there's sort of, you know, you could get fancy and call this an, an endogeneity problem, or you could just say, I think you're confusing cause and effect. Um, millennials have grown up with uh, incredibly flexible labour markets, which basically mean that the only jobs that you can get are part-time, zero hours, flex contract, do three things at once, and also because property -wide prices have gone through the roof, as you've mentioned. So the only way they can do things is by cobbling together lots of things. So then people with assets go, look at those people. They don't want to do one thing. They want to do three things. If you actually talk to the people like, no, I'd like to do one thing. <laughs> it's just that I have to do three things. So I, I think there's an endogeneity problem in that one. I'm not convinced that that's actually the case. No, no. <laughs> Uh, you were showing that the falling rate of profit is a core of the changing uh, the system in the 70s. Yes. And also you were suggesting um, that uh, if we are taking out the, uh, the way property uh, valued in the last years, uh, and we look only to the productivity part, most probably uh, will change a lot in terms of uh, inequality. Uh, I was wondering if there is a link between um, real estate bubbles and the falling rates of profit. Oh, that's a good one. Um, there might well be. Uh, so I just finished a paper on, um, on Britain. 
uh, with an ex-PhD student of mine. And uh, she went off to the public records office in London and got all the newly declassified papers from the time of the Big Bang, the financial liberalization of the city of London. Mm -hmm. And it's absolutely fascinating. All of the problems that came up in 2008, they saw it in 1987. There's like documents, civil servants saying moral hazard, excessive leverage, risk taking, lack of prudential regulation. They saw it all. But they also said, and everything I want, but of course the benefits will outweigh the costs. So we're going to do it anyway. And, and, and I used to be rather sceptical of the sort of the grand claims of the, the financialization literature as it's known, but I've become much more sympathetic to this. Because if you look at Britain, the, after reading these documents, a, a really interesting new story emerges, which is Britain used to have a real economy. Yeah. And, and it had this thing, and it consequently used to have balance of payments constraints. Like now it doesn't, because it doesn't have a real economy. It sucks up capital from the rest of the world. But um, so they had the thing called stop go, right? So basically the economy would overheat, and then you'd put in credit controls, it would slow down, and then you'd move out along the Phillips curve, and then you would bang it again, and up you go, and all that sort of stuff. It had to do with imports and exports and the balance of trade. And that stopped sometime in the 1970s. And the Great Reset, and this is what comes out of this, this, the research of this paper, is how central the liberalization of finance was to Thatcher right from the start. Right? We re I didn't realize it. Maybe other people realized it, but I didn't realize it. I mean, once you basically say, OK, let's sell all the council houses. Let's sell social housing to the working classes. Well, where are they going to get the mortgage finance? Because the mortgage finance is done in a savings and loan type institution called the Building Society, where you have to show up with a 30% deposit. Well, that's not going to work, is it? So what do we need? We need alternative financing arrangements. Well, where are we going to get that? Well, we're going to allow the building societies and the banks to compete with each other, and then they're going to go to the capital markets and borrow directly. And once they've done that, we can start a process called mortgage securitization, which will increase the availability of mortgages. And you can see how this spins out into all aspects. And what Britain ends up doing is swapping a stop-go cycle for a credit boom, crunch, austerity reset, do-it-again cycle. And it goes 87 to 91 with major through Lawson. And then it goes 95 to 97. And then you get the big long one with the new Labour government with the almighty crash. And we're back to it again. London house prices are back to where they were before their peak. Personal indebtedness is back to the same level. That's what Britain does. You know, and it's crazy when you think about it that way. So take, you know, take, take your question on this one. Take housing out. I don't think they have an economy. It seems most of the British economy is people swapping really badly insulated houses and taking profits along the way. There doesn't seem to be much more to it than that. I could generalise this further and say so we had, <coughs> had this profitability crisis in the 1970s. One of the solutions that capital has come up with is to find profit in the unproductive sectors, to increase financial speculation, to make profits, gains from buying and selling stocks, which is pure speculation, a hedge fund uh, uh, model, and also to invest in unproductive areas like household property. And if we can't finance it, then we create fantastic new instruments of financial mass destruction, as it eventually was called by Warren Buffett, in order to create the conditions to make profits that way. So beneath uh, this huge boom in financial profits, we continue to have struggle, particularly in the case of the UK, as Marcus pointed out, in the profitability of the productive sector, which was hidden until we get to the, the crunch when the financial crash reveals and exposes the position. Britain is the classic, now, rentier economy. It's an economy which operated to do away with the productive sector, didn't regard it as important. The workshop of the world died a long time ago, but now the manufacturing sector was allowed to die even more than it has in the US in order to operate into the uh, area of actually laundering everybody else's money. Oil sheepdoms, uh, oil companies, uh, all the uh, billionaires' money flows through the city of London illegally and legally in order to make, and that's how the money is made, through fees, through buying and selling, and the huge prof, uh, revenues that, of the city of London is a key factor now of an economy. This is, this is Switzerland only trying to fund uh, 60 million people living there uh, uh, with, with a whole new range of uh, activities. And it also wants to be in the European Union and not in the European Union so it could do everything at the same time. It's like a great octopus sitting on the top of uh, the productive sectors of capital. And it's, it's increasingly finding it difficult to, to deliver even for its population. I used to describe the City of London as not being part of the City of London at all. It was an aircraft carrier sitting in the, in the River Thames, take, 
people would fly in with money, land, uh, the Saudi sheik's money would arrive, and then the plane would take off to buy American uh, mortgage derivatives uh, where American companies have been lending to subprime mortgages to people who can't afford it, and that the money would flow like off the aircraft carrier, and every morning people would come across the gangplank onto the aircraft carrier to carry out the operations, and every evening they'd be sent home again, and the whole thing would operate completely separate from the rest of Britain. Well, uh, the city of London's had a bit of shock recently, but actually the rest of Britain has noticed mm -hmm. uh, and doesn't probably go on with this particular process any longer. Okay, more questions? Um, if I may step into the gap, um, may, may I ask one question? Um, so, one of the reasons <coughs> that some people hypothesize that despite the predicaments in the outline, uh, the social coalitions that are forced at the status quo uh, uh, is so powerful is that it's not just the shakes and it's not just the billionaires, it's also the pension funds of American and Norwegian public sector workers who act just as aggressively and as, um, as um, neoclassically uh, as uh, the billionaires and the sheiks do. They also run off the city of London, they also operate in the shadow banking sector, yeah. they also contribute to booking profits uh, as costs, thus reducing the imprint of the profit as, uh, in the in the GDP. Mm -hmm. So, in that way, do you think this policy is holding water, or is it just a marginal story that uh, the neoliberals told themselves to say, look, this is actually the popular classes are part of our, our, our coalition? Hang on, can you just clear, you went over a lot of stuff there. What's the take home question? So, because <laughs> <laughs> I had one at the start and then I lost it halfway through. Yeah. Right, I mean, you guys just talked about the top 1% and top 0.1% being right. the beneficiaries of this, right? And many, uh, many economists say, Actually, part of the uh, the winners of the financial sector, the financialized capitalists you're describing, oh, right. are the pensioners and the financial right, organizations. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So therefore, in the golden age, it was easier to bust labor uh, and to create a different so social coalition than today. So this is not just army capitalists versus the people. The people are also part of the capitalist coalition. Yeah. So like the Calpers is the largest pension fund in the world. California public employees, yeah. and um, Calpers is firmly against austerity policies. Because when you throw public sector workers out of office, when you get rid of their jobs, the funds coming into their pension fund goes down. So they have a rather different way of thinking about you know, the problem of budgetary austerity. They far prefer, far prefer devaluations, because that's essentially defaulting on someone else, rather than internal austerity moves. Uh, no, this is, okay, qualification of what we're saying, we're getting a little bit carried away there. If you do the two, if you do the, what's called the, the PAYE data, the, the pay-as-you-go taxation, City of London only really constitutes about 3% of all taxes, right? If you do it as gross value added, at this peak it's about 11%, it's now about 9%. So it's not the tail wagging the dog. The really important part of it is the wider story of shadow banks, et cetera. But also simply, I could show you some slides on this, is where did all the leverage for those banks go? Right? So what, you have to remember the way that banks work. What you call an asset, they call a liability. Right? And vice versa, and it all sums to zero. So you have a house, and they, and they have a mortgage. They like the mortgage. You think the mortgage is your liability. If I don't pay this, I'm screwed, right? And you think you have an asset, a house. A bank has no interest in owning a house. It only wants the income stream for the mortgage. So the assets and liabilities have to match, right? That, that's the, the, the key thing. Now, what happens when you basically have wage stagnation over a long period? Well, I remember when I was 1988, I was working in Virgin Records, when they still had Virgin Records stores. And I was getting paid the princely sum of two pounds an hour. Yes. And all these people, and I was at university, and all these people were coming in, they were kids my age, right? And they all had credit cards. It was incredible. I'd never seen anything like it. And they were like 100 pounds on this and 200 pounds on that. And essentially, if you look at it, if you, you get go to, you can get them off Eurostat, you can find it anywhere, so, or World Bank, look up credit to the private sector as a percentage of GDP over time. And what you've got in the US and the EU is 160% and a 200% increase over 20 years. So wages are stagnant, prices are going up. How do you fill in the gap? Credit, which was the bank's assets, which is the leverage that went bad, which ended up on the public balance sheet. So we are all financialized, right? It's not just the shakes, it's not the millionaire's row. That's part of it, the most visible part of it. But most of it is the fact that I'm walking around now with two credit cards, 
which I think are probably $25,000 each. So I have $50,000 worth of credit in my pocket. That's fucking insane. And that's normal. So that's, that's where that paid, you know, to, to go to your question, that's why it matters in that sense. We've basically been filling in the gap between wages and profits with credit that will never pay back. I just wanted to add that um, I think the question really is, will it, if uh, everybody's workers' pension funds in firms and state pension funds like the California State uh, Teachers Fund and so on, they're all gone into speculation. They've been trying to get buying and selling in the speculative market. So aren't, they, aren't we all incorporated through our pension funds into the system and therefore there's no possibility of, of providing any sort of class division here because we're all incorporated into it. Well, I don't think I entirely agree. Most of the pension funds operating like this are run by people who are not the workers of the companies or in the state employees. They are, they are the trustees, they're the experts. They've all bring in all Goldman Sachs and the rest of them to advise on where to spend and so on. And the best case I think I remember was uh, now the infamous Royal Borough of Kensington and Chelsea in the UK, which had a quite a big reserve. They uh, decided the best way, they wanted to increase their interest that they could get, so they started to speculate, and they are advised by an Icelandic bank uh, to invest in that bank because they were paying 12% and the British banks were only paying 6 So they plunged a load of money into the Icelandic bank, which when the crash came, it all went down. So they lost a load of money for their reserves and for the, for the pension fund of their, of their staff. Uh, they have spent, and they spent several years renegotiating with the Iceland government to get some of this money back. So the taxpayers of Iceland have had to pay back a lot of this money from Iceland. So I don't think that workers had anything to do with this. They, most workers' pension funds, workers don't realise uh, in the private sector are underwater because the company are not using any of the profits to sustain those pension funds. So there's every danger that they could be uh, in deficit. And there have been several cases where company boards have in the end just defaulted on the pension fund or sold it off when the merger takes place and taken all the money out of it and when the company goes bust the pension fund is found to be empty because the owner of the company had run off with the money before you get there. Debenhams I think was a yeah, recent yeah. example. Uh, we, have, uh, we have a very honoured Sir Philip Green who is, uh, lives in Monte Carlo with his wife and has made billions and he's completely de uh, denuded the pension fund. So although these pension funds are operating in the system, they're not operating in the system on behalf of the working people who have made their contributions towards these. They've been lost by the working people. So it's a form of swindle, really. Yes. Uh, I'm a sociologist, so I'm not sure I could follow everything that you've said. But uh, my sort of my question out of your presentation was that um, well, we saw the long lines, like especially in your case, that sort of before World War II, we had a sort of um, um, a sort of closed economies in which sort of the labor and the capital fought on mostly on their territory, so they could regulate their relationships within a closed well roughly closed system. And then you've got the, the, the post world with the inequality between the capital of America, which was out of proportion, the, the, the Marshall Fund and everything, and the, the threat of the Soviet Union that supposedly made possible sort of the golden age of the social democratic sort of social welfare. And then everything you said in the end seemed seem like, so like UA, UK is not a real economy any longer. So that's why somehow I was wondering, well, pre probably that's one of their problems with the, with the labor. I mean, they, the labor doesn't have the tools. I mean, since they're not producing much, how are they able to fight capital? So then we, in the new globalized situation, we will have the, the real workers in Bangladesh fighting with the great the capitalists in the core so how are they if they are the, i'm sorry for the ontology and stuff or the real workers able to f sort of try to to bring back a little bit of the like to improve the relationship between income to capital uh, capital and labor 
So the really tragic side of this is the people who are most successful at this are the right. It's not the left. So think of Orban in Hungary. So how does he get traction? Partly he gets traction by politicizing the central bank. Why? Because they care more about pleasing their colleagues at the ECB and trips to Brussels and all the rest of it. It's very easy to politicize them because it's true. And they don't give a shit about the national economy. Well, that's probably stretching it. But it's very easy to tell that story. So in order to protect labor, you have to define who is labor, who's in, who's out. And the nationalists do that extremely well. Right, so they have that. So think about Trump, right? Trump is, in a sense, an attempt to create a little bit of inflation in the United States through what's called border tax adjustments and through import controls. And in that way, he will ease the debts of his, of his working class constituents whilst maintaining the share of profits that are going to the corporate sector. That's basically the economic bargain they're trying to strike. The one that we want to do is transnational solidarity. That's really fucking hard. It really is. Because you have to care. It's, it's the problem of Hume's little finger. You know the story of Hume's little finger? Oh, a million people in China have died. I pricked my little finger. Which one do I care about more? Right? So we're just horrible as human beings about caring about people that we can't see, we can't touch, we can't identify with. And we try as the left to build that coalition. Now, we did it before. I mean, the Second International was pretty bloody effective at that. We folded in World War I, unfortunately. The interwar period was also showed it could be done. And then the successive unions post-World War II, which had international congresses, confederations, the ILO, etc. When there was power in the working classes, then you could do that. To me, the problem is now the working classes don't have any power. So even if we have the identity politics, and we could even believe that with each other. The problem is we have no real power because, go back to what you said at the start, I can strike, I can up your profits, I can do a sit down, I can do a work to rule, I can hurt you, you will come to the bargaining table and we will find an agreement. And what this, is, what this produced was a nice contrarian investment spike whereby the only way that capital could maintain its profits was with continually investing, which is why the golden age rate of investment was so damn high. Right? I got you, you've got me. The only way this is going to work out is if you keep investing. Well, now we've got a world in which we don't need to do that. Because if I don't like you, I'll just move your job somewhere else. And my margins are so big, I don't need to invest to make money. So the game's changed. The working classes have no power. That's a problem. Yeah, uh, I would continue yeah. very, very much along the. Ah, sorry. Uh -huh. okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, I'm a little <laughs> bit more optimistic than that. Um, if I look at, and I'll start with the pessimistic bit, uh, the UK's strike <coughs> level is the lowest in the history uh, of measuring. It's way, way low. There's no strikes taking place. In the UK, we have strikes, or threats of strikes, in just about one industry, which is transport. In London. Yeah. And not just in London, but it's transport. Railways, the tubes, and the buses. Why is that? Because there is still a point of power where and the, those, un, those workers are actually organized in unions and they have some power in order to bring everything to stand so if you can't get to work, capitalism doesn't work. So it's an issue which the government, of various governments, is really fed up with. They've been moving towards automating trains, getting rid of guards, getting rid of drivers eventually, and just having automated trains. They're doing away with human labor. That's their project in order to solve this issue. So that's, what, and that's in the private sector. We have other communication sectors which also have power. Uh, and they have a potential to, to be used, but haven't been used yet. But they do have power. So what I'm making the point here is that there are sectors of the capitalist economy, even in uh, mature economies, where it's services, there's lots of small businesses, uh, people doing flexible jobs and on computers in their pajamas at home, and there doesn't appear to be any possibility of working class unity. There are still large sectors of mature economies where it is possible for points of power. The other sector which does have often takes to struggle is the public sector. It often goes to defend it, but of course it has no power because the, it, it's just being slashed and the, its ability to teachers don't go to teach and nurses, generally speaking, won't go on strike because they don't want people to die uh, or uh, other sectors of the, of, of the public sector take action. It doesn't seem to have much effect. Capitalists don't care. 
where the kids can't go to school. Uh, uh, they might get a few complaints in the voting process later on, but it doesn't really hit them. It doesn't hit them where it hurts in their profits and uh, their sales. So uh, these two sectors in most mature economies, the transport and communications sector in the private sector mainly, and the public sector, the two areas where there is still elements of traditional working class struggle, but they're limited. But of course, I would add the other more optimistic point uh, is that the working class of the world has never been larger. It is huge. Uh, the industrial workers of the world, as a percentage of the working age population, has never been larger and in absolute numbers. Of course, it's not in mature economies. It's in China, it's in India, it's in Bangladesh, it's in Latin America. Uh, these areas have and continue to have great potential for struggle to change the, the, the position of the power of uh, labor against capital. And so the combination of these factors come together, it tells me that uh, there is a potential for situation change. Mark raised the point that when workers have got strength, wage strength and employment strength, then they're in a position to change the situation because they find the problem. Force capitalists to invest to get rid of them, or they force capitalists to, give, to make concessions. Uh, so that we're not, in, unfortunately, in that environment at the moment because unemployment is still relatively high in most mature economies and needs to, needs to rise. And most of the ability for struggle is not in the mature economies. But it's not completely negative. There are potential points of struggle which I think could develop. And they can be united on a European basis. And we're talking about Europe in many ways. But the struggles of, say, a sector of Romanian workers, if it's auto assembly plants and they have to go on struggle, will affect and will be taken up by workers in Volkswagen in Germany. That the unions do want to link these things together, and these things can be linked together if the situation rises. But they will be on these individual struggles and points. So it's not completely negative. Right? So, yeah, I'd like to continue precisely on this uh, question. Uh, You've started both of your stories from this experience of vast destruction that was the Second World War. Uh, connecting this with the notion of, and the effort of creating transnational solidarity. Wars as contingent events are such moments. They do create, if not transnational, national solidarity for sure. The war economy, army, uh, all these uh, things. Even transnational in the sense that you have allies, at war you fight. Uh, capital gets to be highly innovative, transfer of capital from one sector to the other, it produces a lot of stuff, there is a, a boom. In the current situation where we have uh, wars out there, all the big powers are involved in, in wars. There is a, a chance and we do see forms of solidarity on the extreme right in uh, most of the, uh, the times uh, emerging. I would like to, to ask and maybe uh, go a bit more into the uh, uh, political future, into more speculative, to see, isn't it reasonable to expect that rather such a destructive process might realign the balance rather than by peaceful means, a more uh, balanced adjustment of forces between labor and, and capital, but rather a more destructive uh, process and a much more open-ended process in the end. So, um, wars make profits for capitalists up to a point. And here's my favorite example of this. In, uh, the Bank of France used to be run as a private institution. And there were the 200 families, 60 families, I can't remember who ran it, uh, what number, it was a tiny number of people. And they hated the Popular Front in 1936, the left government. And any time they tried to do anything with the budget, they caused a run on the franc. And what they did prior to this was when Hitler went into the Rhineland in '35, they shortened the franc to make money for themselves. Right? So by the time that you got to 1938, Hitler knew that they would defend the franc, they wouldn't defend France. And that's pretty much how it played out. So you can play that game, but it's a very dangerous one. And when you have a, a world of nuclear weapons, right, really sort of like very nasty hidden political convexities around the place, bad shit can happen. But for me, it's usually 
that's a random element. It might be the Trump element, it might be technological change, it might be environmental change. But yeah, you know, we'll probably go at it again. But you know, will that lead, will that lead to anything positive in a world that's so interconnected? I find it hard to see that, the, in this case, the, the, the benefits would outweigh the cost. One potential flashpoint in this is uh, oil. Um, oil's not going to be above 50 bucks again, ever. Right? It's just not going up. And the reason is basically technological change. The, the efficiency of fracking is unfucking believable. And what they've discovered is they shut down 70% of the US fracking rigs, and productivity went up by the same amount. Because they're just better at getting it. And you can extend the life of these basins, etc. Now, at the same time, in India, for example, you know, given the state of Indian infrastructure, they're the next big one to really try to use energy intensively. They're looking at China. China has just installed in the past two years as much solar as the United States has. And they're just continuing on that path. So if you're India, what are you going to do? You're going to do cell phones and solar. You're not going to do coal once you can get past it. So we're now looking at a point where by long-term fossil fuel routes, regardless of Paris, regardless of Trump, is on the way out. And when that happens, what happens to Saudi Arabia? What happens to that incredibly fragile, super-armed, total cauldron of nasty politics? That's where it goes wrong. Now, at that point in time, the question is, does that affect anyone else? Or does it just turn into a terrible regional conflagration? I don't know. But if you're looking for a fault line, that's where it is. Yeah. Well, I think, uh, I don't think war is a solution for us. Uh, and and uh, it's not a solution for capitalism either, on the whole. Uh, the world war will create the conditions for capitalism to, re to recover. And make it. After it crushed labor movements after the war and defeated them, it created the conditions for getting profitability up, getting investment going, expanding Europe. With the, uh, so in that sense, you could say the Second World War saved capitalism from the Great Depression. Mm -hmm. That's an argument which I think has a great deal of validity for mm -hmm. But small wars, that America has to, America is engaged in small wars all the time because it's the, it's the Roman Empire, just as the Romans had to look after the borders of the Roman Empire against the German tribes, the Gaulists, uh, and all the rest of them, one after the other, down here in the, near the Danube, the same thing, all the time, for hundreds of years, putting them down, losing the case of battle, putting them down again. This is what America is engaged in in the Middle East and everywhere. It's trying to maintain the existing hegemony of uh, uh, American capital primarily, but also in, in, with the coalition of the winning, uh, the other capitals, and it's dealing with these small wars. And they're, they're, they're costs, they're not gains. They're costs, they're not huge costs. I mean, they've been in Afghanistan for 17 years. It's costly, they've lost 2,000 American troops, not too costly. Uh, so on the whole, it doesn't matter about 100,000, 200,000 Afghans dying, or 300,000 Iraqis, yeah. or 150,000 Syrians, it's collateral. Uh, uh, but they continue that process, and that doesn't make money for them. I mean, it makes money for arms manufacturers, but for the whole of the economy, it's not a particularly productive way of operating. It's a cost, in my view. And therefore, it's not a solution. I think the solutions we have to look at is how we're going to plan the world in a better way. Because one of the things, and Mark, concentrate on the question of oil price coming down. One of the things that is heading towards this and is continually being denied is the question of climate change and global warming. The evidence is so overwhelmingly strong that before the end of this century, and even quicker, we will have levels of temperature in the globe, even if we get rid of coal, even if we get rid of fossil fuels from now till 2050, and we reduce the levels, that will be so high, the temperature will be so high that we will have major droughts, major floods, we will have a high increase in people dying early because of the temperature and so on. It will be a degradation of human society across vast parts of the world, particularly the poorest ones, uh, as a result of the rapacious drive for profit and the use of every single part of human planet to make money and to, rather than the interest of the environment of the population. And we cannot go on allowing that to happen. We have to change that. The system upon which this produces to enable us to plan the world in the interest of people, reduce people's working hours, create the environmental conditions that make life worthwhile, and raise the le level of incomes and standard of living for the billions that are still virtually have nothing.
I'm reminded of the line from Lewis Carroll, and then, uh, and then I did 10 impossible things before breakfast. <laughs> Let's make it my lunch. <laughs> Let's have a couple of more questions. Yeah, short sure. ones. Yeah. Since it's here. Um, I just want to push you a bit more because the note is very, very bleak. And since you talk of age, it's very easy to talk of environmental crisis coming on top of us, but before that you'll probably die, but for those who are slightly younger, what, you know, you are Marxist, right? There should be <laughs> answers, there should be suggestions. So can I push you a bit more on to speculate? Well, I think Florin didn't mean that war is the solution, but no, a sort of, a, okay, yeah. how can sh things change in a way that what you describe as what we want to happen will actually happen. So what is your prognosis of change towards a hopeful future? To put it very okay, well, uh, cheesy. Okay, well, I don't know saying this, but I'll try. Uh, in my book, I present an argument that we're in a depression period, depressionary period for world capitalism at the moment. Uh, there are two options that come out of that. One, we have another slump, which is even worse, and it cleanses, and, and uh, it creates the condition, perhaps, for uh, eventually for capitalism to grow without having wiped out a whole load of dead parts of their economy with us going down with it. Uh, that's, and then maybe there'd be a period of growth which could eventually lead to a new period of class struggle of intense nature once workers have regained their confidence in their power in new industries and elsewhere. That's some way ahead. The other point here is, and I think it's a key one, is that we economists can sit at tables and we can look at graphs and we can make judgments about what's going on in the world. But what changes people's lives is human action. And uh, human action is crucial. So I could give you a Marxist pessimist view uh, that the crisis will keep coming and the slump will go down and it's all hopeless. But what happens is that people react to these things. Now, will they react in a way which will change society for the better and for good and permanently and irreversibly, or not? Because if they don't, then we will have all the things that we've just prognosticated will happen. It requires political and human action to do that. It's not impossible that it will happen. Because I can think at the moment we have certain changes going on, even in the advanced capitalist countries. We have uh, a new, the normal political, the political norm, even if the economic norm is there, the political norm isn't there anymore. We have a breakup of the uh, Washington consensus, the neoliberal consensus. We have, a, we have governments coming to power who don't appear to be completely attached and under, getting the message from the city and Wall Street, whether it's Trump off on his own. Twitter, uh, or whether it's uh, in the Europe, where we have a range of more populist uh, movements taking place, whether it's in Spain, uh, even in gorgeous UK, we now have a Labour movement led by a long-standing socialist of 40 years who suddenly is the leader of the party and actually stopped uh, the Conservatives coming through their next round of nastiness. So that we, we have... We have changes that are taking place which do they suggest that there's a reaction, that people are not prepared to put up with this forever, and that they, they will move. Maybe the movement is not so much in having a strike in a factory. It's now more on the political front of the moment, of, of changing, the, if you like, the, the neoliberal rules forever and re reversing that process. And that struggle is beginning to take place in lots of uh, more increasingly important countries. We'll see uh, what happens in France, where apparently we've just They've just elected somebody who fits right down the bill for the law. Uh, and, and, but the, the reason he fits down the bill is because nobody wanted the two traditional parties anymore who were supporting neoliberal politics for the last 40 years, whether it's the Republicans or the Socialists. They've been decimated by the moment by the illusion of some sort of democratic wonder boy. Uh, that won't last if the French economy continues to be in the depressed state we see it now. Je ne suis pas un Marxiste, so that's not a problem. Um, I tend to think the world, so here's how I, think, I actually do think about the world. I think about the world as a disequilibrium system. So it's not, it's not easy to keep things together. It requires a tremendous amount of effort and energy. 
it evolves in the sense that it makes random moves forward and if they work then they stick and if they don't they fail. There is no guiding hand, invisible or planned, and essentially we just muddle through. And as a species, I mean, we suck, right? So, I mean, if Cristiano Ronaldo example, I mean, come on, really? So, exactly, clearly. Um, so, Red Ronaldo, there was something you never thought. Um, so, you know, in, in such a world, where does the, where does the, the hope come from? Well, you know, I'm very similar on this one. So I did a little, I, I, I teach at this place called the Watson Institute and every now and again they stick me in front of a camera and say explain this and I set myself a task to do it in less than 30 seconds. So I did one that was 22 seconds long and I said why is everybody paying attention to the right? All you hear about is the right, it's about Le Pen, it's about the guy in the Netherlands who looked like Willy Wonka's evil twin, right, you know, all this sort of stuff, right? And the thing is they've only won one and it was a marginal victory, right? And you've got Portugal. It's, it's stable, right? The markets aren't giving them shit and they're out of the programme, right? You've got uh, Greece, who went from 0 to 32 and has no choice but to do all the bad stuff, but that's where you are. The party system of Italy has been transformed completely. The centre's dead in France. I mean, the story's actually on the left and the centre-left. And I think there's a moment that if the European institutions don't screw it up, if they basically do what they've been doing for the past several years, which is allow people to have deficits so the automatic stabilizers kick in, actually get some growth going, and then the system can do it, right? Then they'll be fine. If they jump back on the everybody needs to balance their budget, Schäuble a bandwagon, this is going to end very quickly, right? But the positive thing seems to be, even in those moments, I said earlier, the right tends to be the one that like, does this best by defining the nation. We've had recent examples. I was so heartened by Corbyn. I couldn't believe it because there you had somebody who the entire establishment didn't just write off. They castigated. They hate him. He's everything that's wrong. To be like that is to be against liberalism, globalism, everything. You're a populist, you're an idiot, you don't understand anything. And four million people said, no, we like that more. And when you have a political class, as we all have now, that is not, no longer rooted either to labour or capital, mm -hmm. they are a professional managerial class, they go where the votes are. So I agree, it's an, it's an electoral problem, that if you really mobilise on this basis and you keep giving people a diet of crap and austerity versus hope, they might actually vote for hope. What we do with hope is an entirely yeah. different thing, but that's <laughs> Okay, I think we'll stop here. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Thank you, our guests, uh, Michael Roberts and Mark Knight and uh, Cornel Ban as well. Uh, please stay around. There are cookies and wine outside, as usual.